itself was a funny story. But uh, we we had these line of peripherals, um, partly to get ourselves established, get the name established, get uh, distribution channels open, but mostly to hide what we were really doing at the company. We didn't tell anyone what the the secret was of what we were doing. And uh, and so when we went to this trade show finally, and we were finally first showing the prototype, it was shown behind a closed door inside a special viewing arena where there, there was no access allowed unless you had uh, special permission from someone at the company. And always you had to be escorted through the door by someone in the company. So you couldn't, there, there was no way you could get in unless, unless you were someone special who we needed to see the, the device. It was mostly at that time uh, retailers, but there was also some people from the press that we gave a, a sneak peek to in advance, so they, they would write about it. And um, on the outside of the booth, there was all of these uh, peripheral devices, the, the joysticks, the joy boards, and, and it was the, the intention was to make the booth look as if that's what we were there at the show to, to sell, was, was these peripherals. But in truth, we were really there to show what was going on behind the closed door inside. And, uh, and inside, of course, was uh, the Amiga prototype. And it wasn't a, uh, the, the full Amiga computer at this point. It was still just the breadboards, which were uh, hand-wired versions of the chips and the, and the motherboard itself. And these things were works of art. They, they, fortunately, they've survived. I have one of them, uh, one of the other early Amiga guys, Dale Luck, has, has I think, the other three. And um, there's a, and also, so, so we had the breadboards of the three chips that we had invented for the Amiga. And these, oh, if you could see these breadboards, the things were just gorgeous. They looked like miniature cray computers. They were, they were a series of, of planes that were on one side completely covered with components, and on the other side were this massive tangle of wires that connected everything together with these ribbon cables that, that connected them along the spine so that they, um, they, we could create these complete system emulations of what the actual chips would be able to do. It was, they're, they're extremely expensive and hard to maintain high-speed CMOS parts that, that would emulate what the real chips would do finally. So we had a, a nearly full-speed running version of the system uh, that, uh, that would one day be available in silicon. But it was not yet in silicon. It was these breadboards, and it looked like a mass of electronic junk. It didn't look like a computer at all. You had to use your imagination to know what was going on. But we didn't try to hide it at all. We, we uh, had it up on the table and we had the, the motherboard and the motherboard had all of the, the pieces of the, the regular circuit for the computer but then it also had the three sockets on it that were the sockets into which the chips would one day plug. But instead of the chips being plugged in, these, these massive breadboards would come to this big cable that plugged into each of those three sockets. And we presented it all there on the table and then had the output of it running into a, a regular computer monitor that, so that the, the people who would sit and see the presentation would, uh, would be able to enjoy the, the whole experience and, and hopefully, we hoped, they, they would believe that they were seeing the real thing, that they, they weren't seeing... Uh, a videotape or, or some sort of canned presentation. We uh, off to the side sat an engineer who drove the computer from a keyboard and would would cause it would cause programs to be downloaded and and to be launched and and would do interactive things. But the computer also had a, a joystick and and some of the most of the demos were were just canned demos, but a few of them were uh, slightly interactive but just interactive enough that we could prove that you weren't looking at a videotape, that you were actually looking at an interactive computer. Uh, one of my favorites of all was uh, the, the speech demo, where we had these <laughs> two ridiculous talking heads. It was Mr. Amiga, and I can't remember the, what we called the woman, 
And it was Mr. Amiga was a sort of robotic looking guy that looked like he had uh, walked into a door that had the Amiga logo uh, it's, uh, it's embossed in the door and he s- smacked his head on it so it got a dent in his forehead. <laughs> that was the Amiga logo dent. And uh, they were uh, uh, like like uh, out of something out of a cartoon where the the heads never moved, the eyes never moved, just the lips would move as mm-hmm. as the thing talked. But we had created a, a simple phoneme system that that worked with the the speech uh, the, the the speech generation system. The phonemes would uh, would allow the uh, mouth to move along with the speech that was being played in a very simple way. Each mouth had only six or seven different positions that it could be in, but it was enough to give a, a sense of it actually moving. And the the speech uh, the speech generating part of the system was finally powerful enough that you could type at it and uh, and it would reproduce the speech that had been typed. Nowadays, such technology is is becoming commonplace, but back then it was radical, it was brand new, it was so exciting, and this was one of the best parts of the demo, one of the most interactive parts, because we could right there type in uh, questions and answers based on the audience that we had, and prove to the audience that this wasn't some canned demo that they were seeing, but it was something that was actually live, that was truly interactive. When uh, there's a there's a, a big uh, store chain in the United States called Sears, and they have a, a, um, a, a product line called Craftsman, which is the, the tools, uh, wrenches and hammers and uh, handyman sorts of tools. And when the, the Sears fellow was in the booth getting the Amiga demonstration, uh, at, at the highlight of giving him the demonstration, we had Mr. Amiga say to him, I buy all of my tools at Sears. And you know, that was a great little sales gimmick, and everyone laughed. And, and it was a lot of fun, but it also proved to him that this wasn't you know, something where we had made a videotape in advance, but <laughs> we were doing it real time. But and like I said, it was all there, spread out for everyone to see. But even though it was, you know, we were as open and honest as we could be about the fact that it wasn't a real computer yet; it was still a work in progress. People, nevertheless, some people didn't believe that that we were being honest and and believed that we were doing some sort of trick. The the system was spread out on the table, and for aesthetic quality, we had a, a, a drape. Hanging down off of the curtain, uh, off of the table, to to make it look good, and and several people came up and lifted up the drape to look underneath, expecting to see the computer underneath, you know, which was actually generating all of the things that we're seeing, not this pile of wires and components that we were claiming was was this new computer. But of course, there was no computer under there. There's only a power strip that everything was plugged into.